Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. My name is Debbie. I'm your host from NDIS Property Australia, and we have a guest speaker with us today from Darwin, Philip Hoare. Hoare? Is that how I say it? Correct. From Multi-Build Homes. Welcome, Philip. Hi, Debbie. How are you? It's wonderful to have you with us. We've been uh, chatting a bit over the last few months and uh, hearing a lot of great things about what you're doing in Darwin and interesting stuff from the market up there. So I think this is a really timely uh, chance to discuss the Darwin market in relation to SDA. So firstly, would you like to just give us a little introduction into multi-build homes uh, yourself, how you got into the NDIS space and into the SDA space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so multi-builder residential builders, we've been building in Darwin since 2009. Predominantly our history up until this point has been building houses for mums and dads. We've done a fair bit of work over the years for the Northern Territory government. Probably the last five or six years, we've seen quite an influx of home modification work, upgrades and renovations for NDIS participants. So that's naturally led us into the SDA space, which we're, um, yeah, we've got a whole heap of that on at the moment. So it's really exciting. Fantastic. So tell us about, uh, I guess, people are always interested in locations when I've had people speaking to me about Darwin. Yeah, there seems to be sort of a limited number of areas that development is happening in. Tell us about the locations and, and what you do different. Yeah, so Darwin's um, split into two main areas. You've got Darwin itself and the northern suburbs, and then you've got our satellite city of Palmerston, which is about 20 minutes out of Darwin itself, 25 minutes. Palmerston is the Greenfields development area, so that's where you see most of your mums and dads moving, young families, and obviously all of the house and land packages that are that are going up. We're starting to see quite a lot of demand out there from SDA participants being that their families already live out there or are nearby and they're obviously wanting to live close by. There is still a little bit of SDA and obviously quite a lot of demand, but very, very limited supply within the northern suburbs. There is a bit of a barrier to entry in terms of pricing to get into the northern suburbs because it's a knockdown rebuild project as opposed to a, um, to a Greenfields beautiful vacant block of land that we can start building on straight away. But yeah, very, very limited supply and very, very high demand. What challenges do you have in building SDA? I mean, have you got issues with supply of resources and and things like that up in Darwin? Is there, you know, cost factors because of simply the, the location is so far away from the other main parts of Australia? Realistically, the, the cost to build is a bit more than what it is interstate. That's mainly based on the cyclonic standards that we have to meet here. Obviously, we're in a high tropical cyclone region, so everything is built solid. All of our houses, whether they're robust, IL, HPS, fully accessible, they're all built to what you would traditionally call the robust standard. So they're all solid block work. They're all heavy duty fixtures and finishes, cyclonic rated windows tough and glass. So yes, cost of the construction is quite a bit higher. Um, the other constraint that we've got really is with land. A lot of the developers up here aren't friendly towards selling land if they know that it's going to be purposed for SDA. That's led us to obviously have to look at some alternative means of getting land. So we've done some of our own developments to get our own blocks of land onto the market, which has been great. That's helped yeah, 
obviously bring a lot more stock into the market. I think you told me that you had about 80% of what you've been building has been on your own land. Did correct. I have that figure wrong? Yeah? Yep, yep. correct. Um, and that's purely based on the constraints that developers put on us. So yeah, it does, does make it challenging. We just as recently as yesterday reached out to a couple of the, now there are only four developments in Darwin that you can purchase in and three of those four said to us yesterday that we're not interested. Wow. So that limits us to one one subdivision. So yeah, it's it's up to us, unfortunately, to have to develop our own land. It would be nice if the developers would let us integrate these dwellings into the community, but where they fall short, we um, we step in and do what we can do. You're able to get a work around that, which is really good. Going back to the price, I know that, and I didn't actually get a chance to have a quick look before we started this conversation on the um, the location factors. For those of you who are not really aware what I'm talking about, location factors are something that comes into the pricing of the SDA funding. And depending on where someone has funding for, or depending on where the, the dwelling is located, the SDA funding applicable is multiplied by the location factor, the the base level, of course, being one, and the majority around the country probably fall between the, the 0.95 and the 1.05 level just to tweak the actual incomes up or down a little. Um, but I believe it's quite a lot higher in Darwin. It is, absolutely. And with the new adjustments that have come in with the most recent pricing review, our location factor has now been adjusted to 18%. So that's obviously a significant upside. Yeah, so that, that does compensate for that extra cost of development in Absolutely. the first place, which is what the whole point of the location factors are. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's going to cost you more in Darwin, but that's okay. The income is is also higher, so something to really look at. Tell us, I know you work closely with the, the different SDA providers and care providers around Darwin. Tell us what you're seeing in terms of demand. What's going on at the moment up there? Yeah, look, that that's a real... Real challenging point, that one, and that's mainly because there's such a a lack of high quality providers on the ground. the The groups that we work with are fantastic and do an amazing job, but they're they're literally at their maximum capacity with with workload. And speaking to occupational therapists who are involved in assisting participants with getting their plans drawn up and SDA funding in place, they they essentially say to us, "There's no product." available on the market. There's there's no houses that are fit for purpose for their participants. And as such, in the past, when they've gone and written reports and they've gotten the funding for their people, they just simply haven't had a property to be able to go into. So it's very much an exercise for them of, we can spend the government and the participants' money, we can spend our time writing reports, but ultimately, if there's not a, a house for our people to move into, what's the point? They're better off writing reports for for other needs that the participants have. So very much chicken and egg situation where they want to see product on the ground, at which point they'll start writing the reports, start getting the funding happening. But unfortunately, there's very much an undersupply here. A lot of investors are concerned when the demand data is as low as what it appears on face value to invest without that real guaranteed knowledge that there's going to be participants at the other end. Yeah. And again, going back to feedback from the occupational therapists, the demand in Darwin and the, the the pool of eligible participants is phenomenal. Darwin's obviously got some very challenging social problems. There's no lack of participants. There's just a lack of people available on the ground to assist them and to work with them and to get them into the community. And in saying that, there's a massive shortfall of occupational therapists and care providers. But yeah, the reality is there's no shortage of participants. There's just a shortage of time and a shortage of stock. Right. So are those participants actually in the NDIS or you're saying there's a lot more people that could even be in the NDIS that are not yet enrolled? Or are we just talk specifically talking about the SDA? Specifically the SDA. So the majority of these participants are receiving Some level of funding. Some level of funding, and Mm -hmm. for a lot of them, it's substantial funding. The solution that a lot of the care providers have and still providers around town is that 
you've got um, a substantial number of group homes throughout the suburbs. Mm. So old Darwin style, four, five, six bedroom homes that have been converted to house these participants. That's obviously not satisfactory for anyone. It's not satisfactory for the care providers. It's not satisfactory for the participants. And it's certainly not what the NDIS is looking for. Absolutely not. Do you know, are those, any of those dwellings actually enrolled as existing in a legacy SDA or are they out of the system altogether? The majority of them are out of the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing there. Yeah, so There is a bit of legacy where... conversion, uh-huh. but yeah. yeah that's, where the, that's where the data falls down, isn't it? The, you Correct. Know, there are all these participants that, that need the, the proper housing, the SDA housing, but they're not reflected in the system, neither in the, the places that they're currently occupying or in the demand. So Absolutely. that's where in, in, in specific cases like this, we have to rely on, on the intel from guys like you, um, the providers on the ground, to tell us what's really going on. And this is, I mean, we do so much work with the data in our office. We, we do a lot of reporting and a lot of research into it. And there's, you know, we, we're always saying we know that there's so much more going on on the ground, but we just don't have access to that information. So, and, and for people that are looking at the NDIS data in the SDA demand online, you know, it's only a small part of the picture. And you've got to realize that if they're saying there are, you know, so many enrolled dwellings, but there's only a handful of people looking for a dwelling, take that with a big pinch of salt because the reality is probably very different. Absolutely. And far more demand than, than we expect, not just in Darwin, but in, in many parts of Australia. Yeah, and the numbers in terms of demand says that there's 160 odd participants with SDA needs in the top end, mm-hmm. and 10% of those people are looking for alternative or aren't in mm-hmm. accommodation as it currently stands. And with a population of, I can't remember what we're at now, 135, 140,000 people, the numbers just don't add up mm-hmm. with where we obviously know that it should be in terms of statistics coming out of the eastern states. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the data just isn't accurate for what yeah. we're seeing. Yeah, we're finding that is is a quite a common thing through either areas that are newer into the scheme or areas that are a uh, are far smaller. The the um you know Tasmania is a good example. The rural areas are a good example. And I guess it just all comes down to as you said, you know, there isn't the the organisations on the ground to be able to provide the the right infrastructure. To get people the funding they need in the first place, there aren't the OTs and the, the, the different types of NGIS providers to be able to get that funding up front to then drive the development. So Absolutely. as you said, chicken and egg to catch 22 in, in so many places. Um, but, you know, if, if we know from people like yourselves that there is such a massive demand, we've just got to go with it. And talking of the demand, we know, again, around Australia, the averages of of expected participants falling into the different categories, you know, sort of 40 IL, 30 HPS, 20 FA, 10 robust, I think are the percentages that the NDIA has forecast will be across the board. But are you seeing that similar in Darwin, given the, the social economic type level of disabilities up there, or is it a bit different? From the feedback that I've received from the various OTs and care providers, there does seem to be more of a leaning towards robust than what you would see elsewhere. Our prison system, our mental health system is bursting at the seams. There's people that are locked up in prison. There's people that are in the mental health wards that could otherwise be housed in robust Mm -hmm. SDA dwellings. Unfortunately, the system up here just doesn't have anywhere to place them, doesn't have the right resources to be able to integrate them back into the community through diversion programs or through um, supervised living arrangements. We don't have the um, the facilities at a government level to be able to house these people when they come out of the system. All of those people should be in integrated living. They should be in fit for purpose, robust dwellings integrated within the community. Obviously, we have a very big, our philosophy with robust is probably different to a lot of people insofar as we we like to see the houses integrated within the community, but in very specific locations where there's distances and offsets to other dwellings and neighbours and whatnot. 
but definitely massive demand for robust and that demand's only going to get bigger i believe and probably quite new for the nt is improved livability obviously there's some changes at play there but definitely improved livability and fully accessible seem to be getting be the bigger a, demands yeah absolutely that's really interesting that kind of leads me into i wanted to actually ask you about your your designs and obviously you started off by saying that just because of cyclone rating the your builds already have basically robust toughness built in, which is a benefit if if a lot of robust properties are needed. But we also know robust participants generally can't share or only a small percentage of them can share. And I know that you're you've been working on doing a lot of kind of dual key or villa or or sort of designs where basically you've got you've got a bedroom that is a like a, a self contained unit with a larger dwelling, so common areas, but also a bedroom that has its own, obviously, bathroom, living area, kitchenette maybe, uh, which I guess would be ideal for a, a lot of robust participants, that, that kind of separated but with under the one roof type living. So tell us more about your philosophy there. Yeah, sure. So breaking it into two separate categories, our approach with robust is very much to Obviously, from the street, looks like a stock standard traditional house. There's a separation between the participants' room. They've obviously got their own bathroom with an OOA separate with distance back up the front. And then moving down to the back of the house, we've got a, a separated room behind the kitchen, which is essentially a laundry, butler's pantry, all in one. The idea there is the kitchen within the dwelling itself that the participant has access to can remain very sterile. There's nothing that can be removed. Everything's fixed down. And cooking facilities, meal preparation, chemicals and whatnot, food can be stored in that locked butler's pantry out the back. So very much based on feedback that we've received from the care providers and the SDA rules and guidelines are very specific about participants requiring access to all of the facilities themselves but obviously taking the feedback from the care providers that there should be some sort of separation and the ability for the providers to be able to leave knives laying around and that sort of thing in a separate lockable room. When it comes to improved livability, FAHPS, our approach has been to limit our builds to two participants. We do that mainly, again, based on the feedback from not only providers but participants themselves is that there seems to be a stigma about sharing accommodation with other people with disabilities and they want to have a sense of independence and to be able to have their, their privacy when they want to. So the houses for the front half is the OOA, shared kitchen, lounge room, dining room. And then there's essentially two units down the back and you've got a um, bedroom, walk-in robe and an ensuite, and then a separate room which contains kitchenette, um, underbench laundry facilities, and then lounge room, dining room, all slightly bigger than what's required under the, about 15% bigger than what's required under the SDA guidelines, but gives them that separation. So if they do want to come out into the main part of the house, they can share and they can mingle and chat with the carers and the, the other participant. But then when they do want to retreat back into their own, essentially call it an apartment, they can do so in complete privacy. I love the idea that that just meets so many uh, it ticks so many boxes that we hear about uh, is wanted by the participants and the providers. I think that is such a win-win. Would that be classified as a house or a more of a villa duplex? Under the pricing arrangements, those designs are classified as a house. They are? Okay. House to participant plus OOA. So that's basically as high as the pricing will go. The reason we've limited it to two and not three is that it's very easy to find two participants, very difficult to find three. The other problem is when we integrate the apartment methodology into a three-bedroom house, it becomes too big to, to fit on a standard residential block. When we look at the Brownfield knockdown rebuild projects, we're essentially placing that same house onto the bigger blocks, which are 1,000 to 1,200 square metres, and then putting a freestanding one-bedroom apartment, which then is classified as a villa, at the rear of the property. So okay. then you've got obviously a significantly larger investment, but you've then got two occupants and a house being funded up the front and then one 
participant in a villa occupying the rear building. That obviously sends the return through the roof again. Just another product and another another opportunity that people can look at yeah. if, um, if funding allows it. But I'd imagine that would be quite an expensive undertaking. You've got uh, already a knockdown rebuild on a on a large block of land in a good area, I assume, and, and the cost of doing that. But as you said, the returns, what would that come to? Somewhere in the 200s? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Mid to high 200s, depending on the classification. Investments getting very close to sort of $1.8 to $2 million. Mm-hmm. So you're still getting well over a 10% well over. yield yep, on something absolutely. like that. Yeah. The big benefit of doing that is there's going to be exceptional capital growth in those suburbs because whilst we build them to SDA standards in 10 years, if something does change with the scheme, that house can then be repurposed for, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and it's back to being a standard house which would still achieve the same valuation in that period of time anyway. So we're definitely seeing two different types of investors considering Darwin at the moment. People that are looking for that lower price point, happy to go with the green fields in the newer areas, but definitely there's a lot more sophisticated investors that are looking for that longer term capital growth and better areas. So as in, we're talking one street back from the waterfront in Darwin's northern suburbs with parks and shopping centres and everything very, very close by. Yeah, obviously just a substantially larger investment. Fantastic. Back on the on the greenfields, what kind of sizes those new blocks coming in at in Darwin? Just as a comparison to other parts of the country? Yeah, sure. So Darwin traditionally never had anything under 600 square metres in the mm. greenfield areas. If we go back 15, 20 years, there was nothing under 800 square metres. Five, six years ago, the planning scheme was amended and we're now down to 300 square meter blocks. We won't build on anything smaller than 480 to 500 square meters, mainly based on the the size of our housing, which is sort of ranging from 195 up to about 295, depending on the number of bedrooms. So yeah, we, we, we won't go any lower than 500 square meters. It just gives you that flexibility with setbacks and then allows there to be some outdoor space which can obviously be enjoyed by the participants, but then also easily enough maintained. Cool. So I'd imagine that other builders up there are potentially working on some of the smaller blocks with smaller plans and less uh, less attractive packages, I guess. Yeah, so there's there were a number that were built not that long ago and they were essentially built boundary to boundary and a lot of the sizings of the outdoor areas and whatnot weren't practical. And when you look at the availability list, it just so happens that they're all the ones that can't find participants, which is a shame because there's a desperate need. People just don't want to live in those houses. So yeah, we we try to do everything a little bit bigger. Yes, it does come at a little bit of an additional cost, but when you have a participant who has the option, as they should, to pick and choose which dwelling they want to live into, and they're picking one of five houses that all look identical, that are all next door to each other, which don't have verandas big enough to sit on, which um, if you do then sit on the veranda, it's right next to a fence, which is 55 degrees in the middle of the day. Or you can go to a nicer, bigger block of land with beautiful green grass in the backyard and you've got your own apartment that you're living in. Every day of the week, they're going to take the larger block with the backyard, with privacy, with your own private facilities. Yeah, absolutely. For, for realistically, for a, a, a very small increase in cost. Yeah. And look, this is what we're always talking about, future-proofing it. And that what we're talking about when we say that is building it bigger, considering what the participant wants, that it, you know, what everyone else is building, do it differently to, to make it the, pro- the property of choice, because then you're not going to have an issue with finding tenants. You won't be facing vacancy risk down the track as more stock comes into the system. So yeah, and look, by the sounds of things, you guys are are doing exactly what is needed for the participants and the providers, and you're obviously very well connected and and know what the demand is. So, And that's what a lot of investors now who are really starting to understand the space are saying. They want provider-led stock. They want to know that these packages, uh, these houses, these dwellings are going to be approved by the providers, but also by the participants, and it's what is wanted. 
So love what, what you're doing, love the sounds of what you're doing, and we can't wait to get yeah some of your stock available for people to to start looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And and what you said then with regards to future proofing the properties is very, very important. I know myself with my investing that I do, and I know speaking to a lot of other locals who would like to be investing in the SDA space are very skeptical about the future and the potential and the availability of care providers and SIL providers and whether there's even participants, which has really led us down this path of creating these self-contained apartment style solutions. And the reality is we had one drawn up for a client last week. And yes, on paper, the the SDA funding is amazing from an investment standpoint. The rental valuation just as a stock standard rental property came in at over $1,000 a week. I think it was $1,250 a week for the three rooms in the house anyway. So Definitely the the future proofing is is a huge part of what we look at. It definitely takes the concern for me out of investing in the product myself. Yeah, totally. So what other sort of future proofing? I know we have discussed fire sprinkers with you and as a rule you don't include those. Are you hearing anything in, in the Northern Territory about sort of NCC guidelines changing? Obviously, in the review that's just come out, the NDIS review, there was a, a discussion of, of really blending the SDA guidelines and the National Construction Codes a, a little more because it's sort of such a separation of the two at the moment. Um, any feedback on that? Yep, absolutely. We've got four separate, completely conflicting pieces of legislation that we have to work with, whether it's the design guidelines, the planning scheme, the BCA, the livable housing guidelines. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. It, ultimately, I think it comes down to the definition of a vulnerable occupant. There's contention as to exactly what that is. We're putting fire sprinklers into our fully accessible and our high physical support projects, Great. keeping yep. them out of improved livability and robust. IL more than likely doesn't require it. We've got alternative methods of um, of dealing with that with fire blankets and fire extinguishers and smoke alarms, obviously, in each room and in the living areas. And it's also then a um, ligature point in robust housing, which is another reason to keep it out. Uh, sure. We would like to see some definitive guidelines provided with regards to NCC BCA. And what I did hear, which was promising, is the creation of a Class 1C dwelling, which would encapsulate hopefully all of the different SDA categories via the option I can see, which would probably be very, very easy to accomplish is if they just gave precedence to the SDA design guidelines over and above the Australian standards, 1428 for disabilities and BCA. But let's see, nothing moves fast in government, unfortunately, but we can hope that we get some more clarity there in the near future. We're taking the the approach of going higher classifications with building, i.e. going to class 1B dwellings as opposed to class 1A, and if anything, trying to meet a higher standard again. So if in the future, if there are changes yeah. that we've sort of tried to preempt those as best as we can, so there's no issues with certification later on. Great. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Just on your builds, roughly how long does uh, a standard build take in Darwin at the moment? Darwin can be challenging with our wet seasons, so realistically it's anywhere between six and nine months, depending on the level of fit out and depending on what side of Christmas and the wet season that we start. Yeah, rule of thumb is that sort of six to nine months, which traditionally is a lot faster than the rest of the country. Our method of construction generally sees us at lock up within seven to eight weeks of starting. It's only when we get inside and start doing the fit out does things sort of start slowing down. And again, the level of fit out, if we have to do any sort of level of automation, which is generally as a result of occupational therapist's input and participant and occupational therapist-led design, then that can take a lot longer because we just don't have those people in Darwin. Um, so we have to bring them up from interstate. But yeah, certainly it, it's, a, it's a very quick build, especially the main structure itself. Fantastic. Yeah. Look, I think build times around the country have, have certainly gotten a lot better in the last six, 12 months. 
So yeah, good to know that that you're you're keeping up with that, or you know, even doing probably doing better than most of Queensland. <laughs> sure. In in terms of, of those build times, I think that sort of is is all the questions that I had of you I had had to ask of you, Philip. Uh, so just to summarise, I think that what's really come out of this conversation regarding Darwin is that we we have a, a massive unmet demand that is not being uh, reflected in data. So it's it's really important to understand what's really going on on the ground there. Uh, there is also the challenges of lack of people on the ground to support people, the, the carers, the organisations, as you said, are really stretched thin, the ones that you're working with, the, the SDA providers and the care providers. So that is another challenge. However, I guess uh, once those properties are being developed and the participants are getting the funding, that surely that will attract the the workers to come in and support those people. Absolutely. I don't I don't know. It's it's a tough one. And you know, we're we're not really involved much at all on the care side of things. We're still learning very much about the skills and supports ourselves. But uh but I guess at the end of the day, you know, if if you can find a, a great block of land in a good area and and are willing to pay that extra to build a good design, a future proof design, you're gonna have no problem with getting your tenants in there. But as you said, the the OTs and whatnot are not really doing what works required to get the participants the funding in the first place until the properties are under construction. So, you know, these there's it's kind of participant led, I guess, but in a backward kind of way. Yeah, definitely. And look, as soon as we've got projects out of the ground, as soon as the slab's poured um, and the walls start going up, we're then ourselves, um, not that it's really got anything to do with us, but we're straight on the phone to the contacts that we have, OTs, plan managers and whatnot, letting them know, new build on this street, when do you want to come and have a look? Um, And they're very quick to get in the car and come out and have a look through. So yeah, it's there's demand. There, there's definitely demand. It's, it's, um, it's just a challenge. Most things in Darwin's a challenge. Yeah, but uh, yeah, if if anyone is is looking for an area to diversify into in SDA, then you do have a a you know a decent budget to to put out there. So, what would be your average price be? You know, you'd be starting at um, if we're talking about like infill areas, starting at the what one point two, one point five. If we talk green fields straight off the bat, ranging anywhere from sort of 800 to 1.2, depending on the level of fit out. If we talk brown and that's, fields. That's comparative to a lot of other places now in the BC. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. If we talk now, the, the, the main reason for that is the land cost is significantly less. So we Brilliant. can purchase land for 200 to 250,000. Yeah, right. So whilst the build cost might be higher, um, land generally counterbalances that. When we talk green fields, so if we go into a knockdown rebuild situation, then- Infield. In Infield. Yep. Definitely that $1.8 to $2 million. Okay. With the two dwellings on there. Yeah. Would probably be $1.4, $1.5 million if we just went with the single house on the block of land. Yeah. So yeah, look, it's, it's obviously out of a lot of people's budgets if you're looking up to the one million area but uh you know we know that there are a lot of investors out there looking to do something different and i think this is a an an amazing opportunity so put it out there to anyone who's listening that does has been interested in the darwin market or just a different area to look at you know we've been sort of perusing the northern territory market for a little while we haven't really done much up there and we have been working with you on on your plans and designs and uh I think I think we'll be launching a, a bunch of packages, hopefully, or options at least for people in the in the coming week, Philip. Yeah, it's exciting. And we, we wanna see obviously very biased comment, we wanna see more product being built in Darwin. Not necessarily because we're building it, mainly because we know that there is such a strain on the system with people, yeah. like I said earlier, um, being kept in prison or being kept in the uh, mental health facilities in town that should mm. be in in housing they should be in the community living normal lives as best as they can but unfortunately Absolutely. there's just nowhere for these people to go the solution is there it's for investors to get involved and um 
and start creating housing options for these guys. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just such a shame that something hasn't been done sooner and it's falling on to private investors to to fill the void that the system mm-hmm. has created. So yeah, we we would love to see you know over the next several years 15 20 of these things coming to the market or coming onto the market for participants which would then start taking a lot of strain off the system and start fixing a lot of the social problems that we're seeing and obviously then a lot of the overcrowding in the existing group homes that are that aren't fit for purpose yeah for us it's about seeing participants enjoying a better standard of of living and a better lifestyle absolutely yeah yeah all right let's make it happen yeah absolutely did you have any last last words you wanted to add before we sign off today debbie i think we've covered a lot of ground if anyone's got any specific questions with regard to Darwin, with regard to SDA in general in the Northern Territory, doing stuff through their SMSF under one contract, all that sort of thing, happy to, for anyone that wants to reach out. Our details are online, multi build Homes Darwin, pretty easy to find us. Fabulous. I'll put your contact details in the description of this episode too. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, Philip, well, thank you so much for your time today. really appreciate it. Learned a lot about Darwin and and the market up there, and very really excited to see if we can get some more development happening up there and, and getting people amazing forever homes. Absolutely, look forward to it. Thanks so much, Philip. Thanks, Debbie. And goodbye, everyone. Till next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.